Hello, and welcome to episode 589 of the official EstablishTheRun.com podcast. My name is Adam Levitan, as always, joined by Evan Silva, and it is finally here after a long, dark, cold offseason. Training camp is upon us, and that means actual news for us to discuss. Evan, how's it going today? It's going great. Uh, back from Cape Cod, had a really relaxing vacation. We've got, I think, somewhere between eight and 10 team previews up, um, and those will be rolling out. I'm going to be rolling those out aggressively, trying to get them all done by August 1st. Probably will take a few more days after after that, but um, those are going to be coming out. And um, uh, the change log, we, we're going public with the change log. Now uh, all the changes will be recorded with like one-liner explanations going forward. Um, last night I participated in the first pros versus Joe's FFPC draft, which I think consists of 84 players. Um, half of them are pros, half of them are Joe's. I've been doing this for, I don't know, 10 years. You're in that, right? Uh, that? I, I am not. They, they don't, they don't allow DFS bros in there. That is for oh. season. That is for season long bros only. Yeah. I know, uh, both Leone and I did well in it, uh, last year started off at, from the one ten. And it's uh, it's best ball, and it's tight end premium, and it's full PPR. And um, I started from the number ten spot. Took Stefan Diggs, came back, took Josh Allen, got DK Metcalf at the end of round three. Kyle Pitts again, tight end premium was my fourth round pick. Took Alexander Madison at five ten as my first running back. I I, I was pleased how it turned out. Um, it, it's it's a fun event every year. Godspeed. Evan mentioned the change log. He's referring to anytime he makes a change in his top 150 rankings from now on, he will post it in the change log. You'll be able to see a little bit of his reasoning behind why he makes that change. If you do not have our draft kit yet, reminder, it is indeed live. Draft kit pro covers redraft, all of Silva's work, including his top 150 rankings and tiers, shy away, et cetera, best ball and dynasty. And if you plan to play DFS this season, our early bird bundle remains live, combines DraftKit Pro with in-season at the lowest possible price. Check that out on the subscribe page on EstablishTheRun.com. All right. On today's show, we're going to talk through the latest news from around the league and how that has changed Silva's rankings. I want to start with the running back situation, man. And, you know, I, I... I've obviously talked a lot about running back value and how NFL teams were overvaluing running backs in a salary cap league on a personal level. I still somewhat feel for these guys who have such short careers and, you know, kind of get boned by the structure of rookie contracts and the structure of the franchise tag and the structure of the way running backs are used. Saquon Barkley and Josh Jacobs are both awesome, awesome players. They have almost no leverage, but both now are threatening at least to hold out. Evan, have you moved Saquon or Josh Jacobs down in your rankings? And how are you thinking about them in drafts right now? I did not move them down significantly enough to like change the tiers or anything like that, but I did tick them down the overall top 150. Um, I'm a little bit more concerned about Josh Jacobs. And I think you tweeted about this. I'm actually, I would say I'm, I'm definitely more concerned about Josh Jacobs. He's already left Las Vegas um, and he seems serious about, potentially missing early season action. Um, Saquon Barkley has talked about that, but if you if you look at the quotes surrounding some of the quotes that got pulled, uh, you know, and, and, you know, look, people are trying to get clicks, okay? But if you look, it's not something that he wants to do. He doesn't want to miss time. And um, I think at the end of the day, he's probably going to be there. Maybe he misses one game, uh, but I, I think he's going to be there for the vast majority of the season. More worried about Josh Jacobs. What do you think? I think it's ironic because to me, Saquon is more valuable to his team. If if they replace Josh Jacobs with some dust ball, you know, some committee, I, I don't think the Raiders win total would change at all, right? Like when Raiders win total is seven and a half or so, whatever it is. I think if Josh Jacobs said he's not playing this year, their win total would still be seven and a half. Saquon, on the other hand, I could see him meaning more to the Giants. Maybe he's worth one win. Maybe he's worth a half a win, something like that. And, and that's actually a ton. And so it's just ironic that, um, it seems like Jacobs is preparing to take a harder line. I think that I like I was doing a draft, a pretty high stakes draft yesterday. I got Saquon at 27th overall. I was fist pumping it in. I mean, people are scared right now. And so my over under 
on Saquon games missed would be a half, you know, like maybe one, maybe he misses none. Jacobs, I could I agree with you. I could see him digging his feet in a little bit harder. But yeah, this is an awesome time to draft these guys, uh, in my opinion. They're totally slipping agree. hard right now. Uh, totally agree. Um, at the same time, I think it's worth mentioning, just because we're talking about fantasy impact, I don't really want any part of any of the Giants' backup running backs. Matt Breida, their fifth-round pick, Eric Gray, Gary Brightwell. They just signed James Robinson. Um, you know, I think that they're preparing for him just to have all these backs in camp because they know that Saquon Barkley probably ain't going to practice at all. Yeah. Um, at, at, uh, but for the Raiders, I think Zamir White is pretty interesting. Yeah. And I think that he's a guy who belongs in the top 150 going forward because, again, I think that there's a possibility that Josh Jacobs is serious about missing time. Yeah, I like that, Colin. I did think Zamir White could play. I know a lot of tape bros liked Zamir White as well coming out. Um, oh, by the way, me and Josh Jacobs are now close personal friends. I quoted the tweet, and the tweet that I quoted from him was, uh, he tweeted, sometimes it's not about you. We got to do it for the ones after us. You know, And so I quote tweeted that. He liked my tweet, so now we're close, close personal friends. Maybe I'll be able to find out some more information there on Josh Jacobs. All right. We haven't had a chance to talk since DeAndre Hopkins signed with the Titans. Two years, 26 million, can get up to 32 million with the incentives. Not, I think, the best landing spot for DeAndre Hopkins. I took him in the fourth round of a high stakes draft maybe a week or two ago. And I thought there was still like a 20 to 25% chance he would end up on the Chiefs. Um, if I knew he was going to be on the Titans, I probably would not have taken him where I took him, which was like 40 something overall in your latest top 150 you have deandre hopkins at 50th overall mm -hmm. what's your reaction to deandre hopkins going to the titans and the fantasy fallout from that i had him in wide receiver 24 and right around fit number 50 overall before i didn't move him at all um so i'm satisfied with him ranking him as like a fringe wide receiver two slash three he's always been a target dominator leone did a i saw like a thread on twitter about it and leone's like kind of still in on him I would say that I'm meh on him. You know, I'm, I'm kind of – I'm definitely not going out of my way to draft him. But if I get him, I'll feel okay. Obviously, the Titans are a run-first team. But, you know, DeAndre Hopkins has consistently throughout his career dominated targets. And I think that he's going to continue to do that. I think that oh, – what I posted on Twitter was that DeAndre Hopkins is going to be like the chain-moving, high-volume – possession receiver for the Titans and Traylon Burks took a little bit away from him um, because he's no longer in a position to dominate targets on a run first team. But I think he's going to get more downfield uh, big play opportunities. And I think he's going to be efficient. And it wouldn't surprise me if mid season down the stretch, we see Traylon Burks really assert himself as, as the, the Titans future number one receiver uh, because DeAndre Hopkins is obviously aging. And I thought that Traylon Burks flashed enough as a rookie that, you know, I think actually he could be a value in drafts. Exactly. And, yeah. And so uh, my take on DeAndre Hopkins is that two years ago, it looked like he was headed towards the pasture. Last season, he comes off suspension and just smashes. I mean, he played really, really well last season. A take that I have for the Titans is that maybe they're going to be a little bit more pass heavy than we think last year they were only 16th in pass rate over expectation derrick henry is 30 years old now they have deandre hopkins they have Traylon burks they have chig who i want to talk about here in, in a second i could see them leaning into the pass a bit more and so yeah i like where you have deandre hopkins at 50th overall you have Traylon burks at 61 overall i think the biggest hit here is probably to chig chiga Quanquo. you have him down at 132 overall any thoughts on chig in the wake of DeAndre Hopkins signing? Well, I thought that Chig Okonkwo really had a promising rookie season. I mean, he came out of school and he was, you know, he's a big time athlete. He's got size and he led all tight ends in yards per route run as a rookie. He averaged almost three yards per route run, which is just insane. I, I, you know, because now you have a true target hog at the top of the pecking order in the Tennessee pass catcher core, I think that the expectation for Chig is that he is going to be fairly inconsistent, uh, but he's going to make big plays. He's one of these, you know, tight ends in in the range of like tight end 10 to tight end 
15 that I think offers some breakout potential, but I, I would agree that he takes the biggest hit from the Hopkins edition. Yeah, I think this hurts. You know, Hopkins is going to work in this short area type stuff. Chig was awesome last year, but I do think it hurts Chig a little bit. Still want to bet on his ceiling some. He's just, I think the role is going to be a bit shakier. Oh, and the, one other piece of fallout from this. Derrick Henry is, you know, is always a tough click for me, but this signing of DeAndre Hopkins signals that the Titans are in to win now. And whereas in the past, previously I was like, man, you know, is Derrick Henry even going to be around for the playoffs? Titans could be really bad. Now that they have DeAndre Hopkins and like they're going to stick with Tannehill and you can go back and listen to Market Monday. I talked a ton about Ryan Tannehill on there. But yeah, I, I think that um, this is a good sign, a good thing for Derrick Henry. You know, mm-hmm. just more red zone chances, better team, better chance that Tannehill starts all 17 games, better chance they're playing meaningful games. And by the way, in the playoffs, they play the Texans. In the fantasy playoffs, they play the Houston Texans uh, twice. I believe it's weeks 15 and 17, if I recall correctly and that's still a very winnable division so yeah look they they have a lot of roster problems I mean their roster has really disintegrated uh, over the last few years they play they seem to play above their heads every single year because they're so well coached under Mike Vrabel um, but again that's a very winnable division and I completely agree Ryan Tannehill was going like you, like you get him the 18th round oh yeah of underdog drafts people were afraid oh Will Levis oh Malik Willis I get it I mean they use quarterbacks uh, they use draft second day draft picks on quarterbacks in consecutive drafts. I, I get it, you know, um, but I, I would say that right now Ryan Tannehill is the favorite to start all seventeen, and um, you know, he, obviously his his receiver core is at least um, you know it's decent at this point. Yeah, I mean, it, it, was, it was horrible before. It was I league mean, worst. It was yeah. league worst, and now I would say it might even be above average. And yeah, again, please listen to Market Monday if you want to hear. More on Ryan Tannehill. I just took him in a 5-5-5. I believe it was the 18th uh, round. Okay. Next thing I wanted to get to was Saints running back stuff. First on Alvin Kamara. Finally get a resolution on his court case. He pled no contest to a misdemeanor charge stemming from that fight in Vegas. No felony. No jail or anything. 30 hours of community service he has to do. Plus pay a $105,000 fine for the medical bills. Hashtag how rich. We are projecting a four-game suspension for Alvin Kamara. You know, it could be a little bit less. It could be a little bit more. That's what we're projecting right now, but certainly better than it could have been, I think, on the suspension for Alvin Kamara. Meanwhile, Kendrick Miller starts camp on the NFI list, non-football injury list. Kendrick Miller had a knee thing. Uh, Nick Underhill tweeted that this is not related. The NFI thing is not related to the knee at all, which has raised a ton of speculation about what it could be related to. Evan, what are your current thoughts on Saints backfield, I believe you have Alvin Kamara 78 overall right now mm-hmm. and Kendra Miller 104 overall. Yeah, so let's just talk about all three dudes because Jamal Williams at this point, I mean, at least for the first four games, he is in position to lead the Saints. Assuming Alvin Kamara is suspended, which I agree with the four-game projection, Jamal Williams is going to lead this team in touches. Like, heavy favor to do that within the first month of the season. He's going to be useful in fantasy football. He can execute at the goal line. You know, he can he can pass protect coaches love him. Um, I, I think that, you know, the the Saints offense is going to be respectable enough to move the football this year. Uh, so I think that he is I think he's a value in drafts actually right now. Kendra Miller heard during the spring that there were some conditioning concerns with him, that he might have been out of shape at spring workouts, which. That's not rare or that's not that's not un- super uncommon for rookies, you know, coming out, I mean, they're, you know, they're getting free buffets, you know, after, you know, after after the draft and, you know, I mean, they're, they're resting and they, you know, he's got an MCL issue that is probably preventing him from being on top of his conditioning. But I also heard that that was one of the knocks on him in the scouting community that people were concerned with his work ethic. Again, I love Kendra Miller and I have not moved him down and he can go to camp and he can get in shape and none of this will matter. But he did open on the NFI list, and I would suspect that that is because he is not in tip-top shape yet. Um, And I think that that's at least partially related to the MCL injury. With Alvin Kamara, and I took him last night in the FFPC Pros versus Joes at 7'10". That's kind of the the range where he's going now, 7th, 8th, ninth round. I'm willing to take him. I mean, I'm, I'm willing to eat that first month of the season and take him because he's, I think he's still a dynamic player. I know he didn't have a great season last year, but I mean, I think he's still, 
you know, with, with the exception of Chris Olave, probably the most dynamic player in the Saints offense still. I take Alvin Kamara also, and I believe I got him like 97th overall or something like that in a recent draft. That I did, and the reason is late season pass catching at the running back position is so, so, so valuable. And I think with Jamal Williams and Kendry Miller there, maybe they can revert Alvin Kamara to more of a pass catching role. Like, let's not give this guy 15 or 20 carries. Let's get him seven or eight targets every single game. And I know it's getting crowded with Michael Thomas healthy and Chris Olave being a baller. But man, and, and I think Rashid Shahid can play as well. But man, if you can get Kamara to start getting those targets late in the season, and that's his role. I think that's super, super valuable in the full. Yeah. I think he's yeah. a steal in best ball because um, you you can eat that first month, in, especially in best ball, and then he can be a spike weak player the, the rest of the way. All right. Continuing on with running backs, Joe Mixon agrees to restructure. And this one was not a surprise to me. Uh, maybe Evan thought he was a, a little bit more at risk of actually not coming back. The signal to me that they were going to bring him back and he was going to agree to it was they have done nothing at the running back position and they are firmly – in the Super Bowl window. The window is not going to last that long. Joe Burr has to get paid. Jamar Chase has to get paid. They may lose T. Higgins. They have a ton. They have, I mean, they have a loaded team, but it's not going to last. So you cannot go in your one year or two year Super Bowl window here with Chris Evans and Travion Williams and, and Chase Brown as your running back. So I always thought Mixon was going to be back. Still has this off field issue over his head. I've heard some conflicting reports over whether we should expect a suspension or not on Joe Mixon for the incident with a gun ahead of that Bills game, I believe it was, uh, in the playoffs. I have not been able to find concrete anything on Mixon's suspension. You have him at 54 overall. What do you think about Mixon now that we know with 100% certainty he'll be back with Cincy? Yeah, we talked about his contract situation very early in the offseason. I think the, the video team even actually clipped what we were talking about. I was like, they probably should cut him because – they could have saved a ton of money doing that. They didn't have to cut him because he took a massive pay cut. I mean, it was what he shaved five or $6 million off of his salary yeah, yeah. for, for this year and next year. I mean, yeah. that was a huge pay cut. Um, and I, I agree with you. Like it, it became, it got to the point where, you know, the only addition was chase Brown, a fifth round pick out of Illinois. And they kind of had to work that out. I, I'm expecting a two to four game suspension, but again, that is not concrete. And like Alvin Kamara, I think that Joe Mixon is actually a steal in drafts, especially best ball drafts. He is in line for a ton of work. Um, I think that Travion Williams is worth taking late in drafts, like, you know, uh, somewhere around picks 130 and, and 150, somewhere in there. But I mean, I, I like the idea of taking Joe Mixon. You know that this is going to be a good offense and you know that he's going to be on the team and you know that he's going to be there, you know, at, at worst for the final 13 games. I mean, I think he's a steal, actually. You know, you have Joe Mixon 54 overall. I've seen him start to go much higher now that this is actually uh, – I've seen him go in the 40s now that this is settled. One thing I would say about Mixon, uh, he was not good last year on efficiency basis, but he lost so much third down work. And, yeah, I know that Chris Evans and some of these other guys and Travion can play – on third down, but what if Mixon actually takes some of that P Ryan role? I mean, his role could actually be better last year when his expected fantasy points was absolutely through the roof. And so his role, you know, could really, really be awesome. I'm a little worried on efficiency, but I do think his role could be really, really awesome this year. All right. Some more running back news. Melvin Gordon signs with the Ravens. I honestly thought Melvin Gordon was done. Like, I didn't think Melvin Gordon was going to make his way back into the league. I thought it was over because the Broncos cut him last year. He signs on with the Chiefs practice squad. And the Chiefs needed running backs. He signs on with the Chiefs practice squad after he gets cut from the Broncos. He never even gets in a game for the Chiefs. He's 30 years old now. Melvin Gordon was PFS number 60 running back out of 60 qualifiers last year. I do not think this is an impact at all. It strikes me as like a camp body, camp body type thing. I understand J.K. Dobbins is pissed about his contract. Guy has zero leverage. I mean, he's been hurt. He's played a total of eight games in 2021 and 2022 you have jk dobbins 67 overall gus edwards 124 overall what do you think about the melvin gordon signing anything else on jk or gus edwards i think melvin gordon is washed and this move was made by the ravens um well first of all they have a long history of signing like late career veterans um, they've had a lot of success with that. I don't think that they're going to have success with, you know, much success with Melvin Gordon, but I think that he's just a cl classic, like 
insurance pickup. It can't be Gus Edwards and Justice Hill handling everything. We don't know. I mean, there, there's just ongoing concerns about J.K. Dobbins' health. And he's sort of like clashed with the organization a little bit. Yeah. I think it's just an insurance move. You know, I'm not like putting Melvin Gordon in the top 150 or anything, but I think it that it does maybe reflect some concern about J.K. Dobbins' health and or the way that he feels about the organization. Yeah, I talked about it a little bit on Market Monday. I, I never thought that J.K. Dobbins looked right last year with his knee, and he still averaged 5.7 yards per carry. I mean, the efficiency that you get out of this run game is so ridiculous. I will note that not only is J.K. Dobbins uh, on the pup list to start camp, but also he never participated fully in any OTAs or mini camps. Like we haven't seen him really practice fully in a really, really long time. So certainly something to watch on J.K. Dobbins. Yeah, Has how are you um, approaching him in drafts? Because I've seen some smart players taking J.K. Dobbins, and every time I just kind of cringe a little bit. Like I, I don't think I've drafted him once. Yeah, we're like five spots below ADP, and somebody always seems to take him before ADP. So yeah, I, I really haven't gotten him uh, much either. Um, somewhat in that range also is Isaiah Pacheco. You know, it was so funny. Like there was a lot of stuff on Isaiah Pacheco. Oh, he's not gonna be ready for camp. There was all this speculation. He's had this, this surgery nobody knew about to hit the labrum in his shoulder. I, I always thought that that was somewhat overblown and that proved to be right. I mean, people were like victory lapping their zero Pacheco exposure. Turns out he's ready for camp. His hand looks great. His shoulder looks great. You have Pacheco at 72 overall which reflects, you know, what I think is the consensus opinion out there that Pacheco is miles ahead of Clyde Edwards Alaire. Like it's not even mm -hmm. it's not it's not even close. So, any thoughts on the Chiefs backfield here as we know Pacheco is now healthy? Yeah, a lot a lot of thoughts actually. Um not worried about Pacheco. I think that I could actually move him up a little bit. Actually, I think I want to move him up a little bit. Get him into the 60s somewhere in there. I I I'm going to do that. Um I feel good about his health. Jarek McKinnon, what, he had like freaking nine receiving yeah. TDs or something last year. I think he's still going to have a role. And actually, I took him in this uh, FFPC Pros versus Joes last night as my RB3 or RB4 or something like that. Um, he's a player that the, the coaches obviously trust. He can play in the passing game. Pacheco doesn't really play in the passing game. So I think that McKinnon has, even though if you look at his contract, it, it makes you a little bit worried because he's like playing for the minimum almost. But mm -hmm. Um, I think he has a defined role on the team. And apparently, Clyde Edwards Hilaire showed up to camp out of shape. And there is some concern that he may not even make the 53. And this generic Prince guy who we've talked about several times, he's like a spark freak. Um, he had minimal production. I think he had, he, I don't even think he got to 120 carries in any of his college seasons. But he's one of these guys who, like, because he tested so well, speed score freak. Um, the Chiefs use a lot of, like, athletic, um, uh, analytical, like, uh, boards. And, you know, they de de determine that he's a guy that they want to take a shot on. Nate Tice, uh, who does the uh, the Ringer show with Robert Mays, tweeted me that Daenerys Prince really stood out at the, uh, the Shrine game. And... He was a guy that in college caught like nine career passes or something like that. But early in training camp, he's been like popping out as a receiver. Like there was some uh, big play from Mahomes to Daenerys Prince uh, in the receiving game. So I thought that that was promising. Definitely a key name to keep in mind, not putting him in the top 150 or anything like that. But Daenerys Prince, certainly for preseason DFS. I'm getting – serious uh, Darwin Thompson vibes here, Evan. If for you guys who have played preseason DFS, and actually one of my first big DFS scores was a week 17 game in which I played uh, Darwin Thompson, but there was like pictures of this dude with his shirt off, just a total athletic freak, never really amounted to much. But yeah, this generic Princeton kind of reminds me about that. And that brings me to this Kadarius Tony knee news. So the reports on Sunday were that Kadarius Tony hurt his knee fielding a punt and went to the locker room and hasn't been seen since, didn't practice Monday. Schefter tweeted um, today, Monday, that Tony had a cleanup procedure on his knee during the offseason. He aggravated it Sunday. He's going to miss some camp time, but he should be ready for week one. The thing about this, Evan, is that Kadarius Tony, and you know, like, I know we got into the whole thing about injury prone and Christian McCaffrey. To me, that's totally different. Christian McCaffrey's type of injuries were different. Christian McCaffrey plays the running back. 
position. Kadarius Tony has shown just like a stone cold inability to get on the field for tons of reasons. You know, off field stuff. Uh, coaches don't like him. Uh, and injuries have been uh, very persistent. So he's a rapper. He's a rapper. So he he's gonna he was going in the seventies. He's actually a pretty decent rapper. He's actually going in the seventies, and like he was going in the seventies, but now everybody's going to be out on him. Even people who like Tony, I feel like are like fed up. I mean, I could see him going 95, 100, 110 before this whole thing is settled. At that price, I'm certainly intrigued. But yeah, Evan, what's your reaction to Kadarius, Tony, and the Chiefs wide receivers? Yeah, it's it, it stinks because he is such the classic flash player that, you know, he really teases you. Uh, even last year, I think it was uh, Bill Barnwell tweeted out that K- Kadarius Tony has played over 70% of the offensive snaps in a game one time in his NFL career. Uh, now, last year after the Chiefs acquired him, his targets per route run were like off the charts. Yeah. And they would manufacture touches for him. And, you know, they they wanted to make it work. It's just there's always something with this guy. I remember, you know, when he was with the Giants, the, the rumors were that he would have the health problems because his work ethic wasn't always there. Um, obviously is a, an exciting talent. I'm going to drop him because I'm worried about him being ready for week one. I mean, I know that Schefter said he's expected to be ready for week one. I'm just, I'm not convinced of that. And then when he does come back, you know, he won't have practiced at all in training camp. I have heard though that Rasheed Rice, who the Chiefs traded up to draft in the second round, it seems to be being widely ignored. Um, mm-hmm. People have been trying to compare him to McCole Hardman and, uh, you know, Clyde Edwards Hilaire is a player that they overdrafted or whatever. And uh, but Rasheed Rice apparently has has been off to a really hot start at Chiefs camp. And he's going to get a ton of reps with Mahomes, with Kadarius Tony on the shelf. The comparison for Rasheed Rice, apparently among among the Chiefs, was to uh, like a, a, a better version of Juju Smith Schuster um, and that he's going to play in the slot. Yeah. And that's interesting because there's been speculation from the athletic that Sky Moore would be the slot receiver. But if Kateris Tony can't be out there, Sky Moore might have to play outside. There's also been some buzz on Richie James. I mean, there's a lot of guys here. I mean, I, to me, the best deal all offseason has been MVS. And that's the one we've been highest on versus market in our rankings has been Marquez Valdez Scantling the whole time. You know, the role is going to be there. He's going to be solid. They also have Justin Ross. They also have Justin Watson, who they like to give routes to as well but yeah i thought Kadarius tony was probably going too high anyways before but if he starts going the hundreds you know i I think that's where i'd be more in on him i agree with you on marquez valdez scantling too because he's got a unique skill set in that chiefs pass catcher core that nobody else has yeah Um, and i've been drafting him as well i have him on 30 percent of my underdog teams okay perfect jordan addison got pulled over going 140 miles an hour in his Lamborghini in a 55 mile an hour zone. I'm honestly not sure how he doesn't go to jail or or gets arrested like on the spot for this. Uh, But as of now, there's no criminal charges. The report says that he told the cop he was speeding home because there was an emergency with his dog. Obviously, I am very sympathetic to the dog community. I prefer dogs to people. And so I, I stand, I stand with Jordan Addison on this if he was in fact him going home to help with his dog in an emergency now i don't think there's gonna be a suspension here but i wouldn't completely rule it out i mean one forward in a 55 especially in light of the henry ruggs thing and listen i know it's totally different henry ruggs was drinking the, there was a, a horrible result there was no horrible result here with jordan addison he wasn't drinking but still i don't think it's out of the question of the suspension we are not projecting suspension right now evan you have jordan addison 88th overall mm-hmm. kj osborne unranked mm-hmm. tj hawkinson 48th any general thoughts here on addison or vikings pass catchers i'm already and we leone and i argued about jordan addison and he's high on jordan addison this year and i'm really not this doesn't affect my ranking whatsoever um, but i'm already uh, a little bit below market on jordan addison dude 140 is fast yeah i mean I think I've gotten up to like 110, you know, and like, and I'm like, all right, we're, we're slowing down. Like 140 is so fast. Yeah. Yeah. Glad he's okay, I guess, is, is, is the really the bottom line. And yeah, I don't think we'll see a suspension, but maybe. And yeah, I, 
I've started to sprinkle in a little bit more KJ Osborne. Not that I like KJ Osborne, but if Addison does bust, it's such an amazing opportunity uh, for KJ Osborne. I don't think he's really like, good enough to be a star or really a difference maker. But yeah, if you think Jordan Addison isn't it, I'd be sprinkling in some KJ Osborne. And obviously, I like Hawkinson at the four or five turn. Let's go to some smaller things here. Cole Beasley signs with the Giants. I honestly don't even know what they're doing. I mean, slot candidates are Darren Waller, Paris Campbell, Jalen Hyatt, Wandale Robinson, Sterling Shepard, Jamison Crowder, and now they add Cole Beasley. Wandale and Sterling are coming off of ACLs. Jalen Hyatt played in that extremely raw, gimmicky Tennessee offense. Crowder and Beasley are probably dust. I still think Paris Campbell is the favorite here. Like he's the, he, Paris Campbell, to me, is the favorite by a wide margin. I just don't know if Paris Campbell is even that good. Darren Waller, obviously, is my favorite pick here among Giants pass catchers. But yeah, any reaction to Cole Beasley? Or any thoughts on Giants wideouts? Well, you talk about like collecting slot receivers. I mean, you know, you know the the GM for the Giants and, and Brian Dable, like they come from the Bills, and the Bills did that same stuff. You know, Isaiah McKenzie and Cole Beasley, and you know they drafted Khalil Shakir, who's you know primarily a slot slot type talent. So they're just kind of bringing that philosophy. They can play with two slot receivers. Darren Waller's going to play in the slot. Um, Again, I think that they're just kind of – they know they don't have a star receiver, so they're just kind of throwing everything that they can at the wall. And um, I don't know. I, I don't think Cole Beasley is going to make the team. Yeah, I, I like Waller. He goes in a spot where I don't typically take him. Paris Campbell is one – is and, and Sl- Paris Campbell and Slayton have been really the ones that I've been taking where at their uh, at their ADP. But, yeah. Um, there was a quote from James Jones, former NFL wide receiver James Jones. James Jones said he talked to Todd Monken – Obviously, Todd MFing Monken, favorite of this show, new offensive coordinator for the Ravens. And Monken told James Jones to take Lamar back to Louisville. And I think what he meant by that was play spread, get four wide receivers on the field. You can do that when you have Rashad Bateman, who, by the way, has been cleared, Odell Beckham, Zay Flowers, Mark Andrews. I mean, this is the best weaponry that he has had. Evan has Lamar Jackson in the same tier as Allen Hurts. And Mahomes. In fact, Evan has Allen Hurts, Lamar, Mahomes all back to back to back to back in his rankings. That is not how the market has it. The Mm -hmm. market has Lamar a tier below, around below. I tweeted that I actually agree with Evan that I think Lamar belongs in the tier with these other three top guys this year. But yeah, Evan, any thoughts on those James Jones quotes and Lamar and the pass catchers? Yeah, I thought that they were pretty interesting. Um, James Jones has like become like a pretty good reporter. You know, obviously he played a lot of years in the NFL. Now he works for NFL Network, um, and he has like a lot of plugins with dudes around the league. Um, so, and and I'm not really surprised by Todd Monken's comments. I mean, Tom, Todd Monken has an air raid background, you know, going back to Oklahoma State, made you know Brandon Whedon look like a, a guy who went in the first round of the NFL draft. So, um, Todd Monken has had a lot of success designing offenses, and I think he's going to have a lot of success designing the Ravens offense. I thought it was, uh, there were some interesting co- quotes that came out today from Odell Beckham. He said, he thinks that this is going to be his final NFL season and he's going balls to the wall this year. I thought that that was somewhat encouraging. Also encouraging Rashad Bateman, yeah. who has struggled with ongoing foot injuries since really since entering the league almost and, and um, had some injury issues uh, at Minnesota he was cleared to begin the start of training camp, was able to avoid the PUP list. Apparently, Zay Flowers has looked great. Um, obviously, they got Mark Andrews, uh, and they have uh, Nelson Aguilar, who's probably one of the better f- uh, number four receivers in the league. So they can play this spread. They have the personnel. Do you think that the spread is a negative for J.K. Dobbins? I mean, they've been so efficient in their run game, but it has not been any kind of spread. It's been very like Greg Roman, you know, two wide receiver type mm-hmm. stuff. A ton. Do you think the four wide would be a negative for J.K. Dobbins? Yeah, I, I, I'm not, I'm not totally sure. I, I'm just like, I, I think that J.K. Dobbins is one of the biggest conundrums in all of fantasy this year for the second straight year, really. Yeah. I mean, because he was such a conundrum last year. Um, you, you know, you could tell yourself a story where it's bad for him. You could also tell tell yourself a story where. He, if this dude comes back, I mean, he's playing on one leg, averaging over five yards per carry last year. If he comes back at even 80, 85% health, he could smash with 100-yard games. I mean, the offense is going to be really good, and J.K. Dobbins, when he's healthy, that, that dude can run the football. 
All right. Speaking of guys coming off injury, I've been following this Brees Hall stuff closely because I do like Brees Hall, I think, more than Evan. I've been taking Brees Hall back end of round three plenty on the thesis that if he is healthy, and I understand that that's a big if, but if he is healthy and they don't add anyone else like a Dalvin Cook or anything, he legit has a similar outlook to some of the running backs that go in round one and definitely the running backs that go in round two. So I was encouraged to see that the Jets, and I understand the Jets put this out, but the Jets clocked him at 23 miles an hour running straight line. Obviously, when you come off an ACL tear, it's not the straight line stuff that's the hardest. It's pivoting, it's side to side, it's cutting, et cetera, et cetera. You are a little bit below market, not much, but a little bit below market on Brees Hall, still Evan at 40th overall. I assume you saw this 23 mile an hour per thing. Mm -hmm. 23 miles an hour would have been the fastest player in the league last year. Uh, By the way, Paris Campbell was at like 22.1 last year, fastest recorded ball carrier. But anyways, Evan, what are your thoughts on Brees Hall right now? So Brees Hall is coming off a knee injury and players coming off knee injuries. What you worry about is not their straight line speed necessarily, but their ability to make cuts. Um, That's awesome that he's running fast. When he came out of college, he, he tore it up uh, from a measurable standpoint. And I mean, he's a, he's like a legit first round talent. Uh, I am still scared off by the reports that, that the Jets wanted Jameer Gibbs, number one, that they pursued Jamal Williams, number two, and that they wound up drafting Israel Abinikanda mm-hmm. out of Pitt. Um, so I think that there have been some expressions of concern from them regarding Bry- Brees Hall's health. At the same time, like I kind of want to be in line with ADP. So maybe I'll, I'll give him a bump up after the, the miles per hour report. Um, but I, I don't know. There's, there, yeah. there's something there that, that's giving me cause for pause. I, I think the Dalvin Cook thing too. I mean, they have yeah. not shot down rumors that they are in the mix for Dalvin Cook. And so we'll see there. Maybe they're just waiting to see how Brees comes along over the next month. I mean, it's still pretty early. We're recording this July 24th. Week one is still six weeks away, uh, roughly. All right. Damian Harris versus Latavius. And this was one that kind of flew under the radar. But Joe B, Joe Biscaglia, who I love, who covers the Bills for the Athletic, he has it close. He thinks that Damian Harris versus Latavius is a legit camp battle. The money isn't all that different. Harris got like a few hundred thousand more. I'm just biased because like, yeah, I just want to write off Latavius Murray. That's my first instinct. He has shoved it down my throat many times, specifically in DFS last year for the Broncos. When he was real cheap, he projected well. I didn't play him, and he just shoved it down my throat. Repeatedly did Latavius Murray. So, Evan, what do you think about speculation? There's a battle here because I know Damian Harris has been going pretty high, actually. He's been going in like 110, 120 in that range. Yeah, you know, my lean, my inclination is just that Damian Harris, like when when he's healthy, he's like a really good runner of the ball. Um, You know, he's not going to give you a whole lot in the passing game. He's not necessarily like a big play threat, but he can run the football between the tackles. He's a quality ball carrier. Latavius Murray's 33. I think that Damian Harris, again, if he stays healthy, if if he is healthy, because he's been hurt a decent amount. uh, Certainly he was last year. But if he's at 100%, I mean, I think that he he should just straight up beat out Latavius Murray. Um, Where are you standing on James Cook right now? Oh, because Naheem Hines is out for the year. Yeah. So, So, yeah. So I I think that that's, you know, none of us were drafting Naheem Hines, but I do think that that could be significant for James Cook. Sure. I mean, neither Damian Harris nor Latavius Murray are essentially past game backs. James Cook certainly is. My concern with that is always that Josh Allen's third rate at running back is so low. I mean, it's like pathetically low. I'm not sure how many targets are variable there for running backs, but yeah, I, you know, I do a ton of these hero and zero RB teams in best ball, specifically PPR. And I get James Cook a lot at like 90 something. Um, I'm not like fist pumping in on him there, but I do think the Naheem Hines thing is reasonable for them. And I also think, though, the, the bigger concern for me is that this could cause them to add a running back. Like, how much would Kareem Hunt cost the Bills right now? Like, probably very, very, very little. So that's a concern there, too. But, yeah, I do like like James Cook. Uh, if he does well, I'll call him Jimmy Cook because we'll be close personal friends. A um, couple more small ones here. Devontae Parker got this, quote-unquote, extension. It's really not an extension. It was reported as three years, $33 million, which is completely laughable. It's really just pay as you play massive incentives and bonuses in there. I don't think this should change the outlook on Juju Smith-Schuster or Tyquan Thornton or Mike Jasicki. And I actually think the bigger boost for these guys is that the Patriots didn't get DeAndre Hopkins. You know, like I was a little bit worried for 
Juju and Thornton and Jasicki when it looked like they were in the mix big time for Hopkins. Now they don't have him. I kind of like taking the all these guys. I think they're they're their price tags are so low. Juju, Thornton, Jasicki. So yeah, any thoughts on the Devontae Parker stuff and Patriots pass catchers? Um, you know, it, it locks him into a roster spot. Again, you mentioned DeAndre Hopkins did not go there. And there were at one point, I think that they were like the betting favorites to land DeAndre Hopkins. Um, I think that they're just late round best ball picks. I know that Pat Thorman, who's a Patriots, uh, you know, aficionado, he, I, I, Tycho on Thornton is like one of his highest. Oh, he, he has Kenneth Gainwell as his highest owned player. And then I think Tyquan Thornton is his highest owned wide receiver. Um, I've taken a little bit of Devontae Parker, a little bit of Juju. Um, I'm not excited to draft really any of them, but I do think that they're worthy, you know, late round picks, you know, wide receiver sixes kind of kind of deal. I think Mac Jones is going to be much better this year, man. Like last year, they didn't even have an offense or an offensive coordinator. They're just going to be better organized this year. And I think Mac Jones will be way more comfortable and play better. And I think they're going to have to throw a ton. They have a brutally hard schedule. They're going to be playing from behind a lot. And so I think there's more volume to chew on for Patriots pass game than maybe people realize. We should also mention that they worked out Leonard Fournette, which is a a connection that Thorman had speculated about. Um, They they have not signed him, at least not yet. Um, But, you know, they obviously showed interest in Leonard Fournette. Yeah. And they also worked out Daryl Henderson that day. Uh, They didn't sign either of them. But yeah, they're clearly kicking the tires on running backs. Talked about that a little bit on Market Monday. Jimmy Garoppolo, as expected, at least for us, as expected, passed his physical, the foot thing. It was more of like a money contract thing when that story blew up. It was never really that much about his health. Raiders, uh, you know, wanted to protect themselves, et cetera, et cetera. I don't think Jimmy Garoppolo is really a target for me in many formats, not even in like late best ball. But we have been ahead of market on Devontae Adams this entire time. Evan has him 10th overall. You were getting Devontae Adams like 13, 14, 15 for a while because I think people were scared about the Jimmy G stuff. And obviously there's some systemic risk as well with the Raiders just falling apart as a team. But I I like Devontae Adams, man. Like I would take Devontae Adams 10th overall for sure. I think I prefer Devontae Adams to Mon Ra. I think I prefer Devontae Adams to CeeDee Lamb. What about Diggs? As well. I prefer Diggs to Devontae Adams just for the offense and systemic stuff. So um, yeah, what do you think about Jimmy G reporting anything on Devontae Adams? You know, the Raiders never made a move that um, indicated that they were worried about Jimmy Garoppolo. I mean, they've got Brian Hoyer, Josh McDaniels. He's just like, bring back all the Patriots, you know, all the guys that I know. You know, he's the classic, like, um, you know, cronyism. You know, the this guy loves, cron- yes. oh, yeah, he's such a cocoon guy. Uh, Brian Hoyer is the number two quarterback. And then they their number three quarterback is Aiden O'Connell, Aiden O'Connell, fourth round rookie. So Jimmy Garoppolo is good to go. He's not an exciting pick, but when you take Devonte Adams in the first or second round, and then you can get Jimmy Garoppolo as your uh, QB two or QB three, super late in drafts, I think that that makes sense as like a little sneaky stack. Yeah, you can get major backdoor. I mean, nobody takes Michael Mayer, Evans' boy. Nobody. I mean, he's like literally free. Um, and the target competition for Devontae Adams is vastly reduced from last year. I mean, Jacoby Myers is going to be a presence, but we don't know what the deal is really with Hunter Renfro. They didn't seem to like him. You know, he's not one of Josh McDaniel's cronies. And then, you know, they got Austin Hooper and, and a rookie, a yeah. good rookie, uh, but albeit a rookie at tight end. So Devontae Adams should continue to just smash from a volume standpoint. All right, last one I have here is notable. I think Javante Williams, surprisingly, avoids Pup. Now, Javante Williams is coming off of a much, much, much more severe knee injury than what Brees Hall sustained. I'm pretty surprised that he's not starting the year on Pup. I'm not going to overreact to this because sometimes teams don't start guys on Pup. They just want them to be out there on the field. Doesn't mean they're practicing. Doesn't mean they're cutting. Doesn't mean they're running. They're just out there on the field with the team. They don't want to start them on Pup for whatever reason. Um, But still, has to be taken as a good sign for Javante Williams. Did you move Javante Williams in your rankings based on this news? And then we also have to talk about P. Ryan stuff. I have not yet. I may. I'm going to look at the rankings tonight and just go over them because I know I need to uh, uh, move uh, Tony down. Uh, but I'll just go through all of them. I would say and, and you know make make little tweaks. I would say I'm probably not going to move them down. I just I have a lot of um, a lot of ongoing concern about. 
the the severity of the injury that he suffered. It was ACL, PCL, and some other stuff. Him avoiding pup is not bad news, but again, yeah, it, that, that doesn't guarantee that he's going to be ready for the start of the season. And I'm I still have a level of skepticism. Um, and I think that Samaj P. Ryan is going to come out the gate. Like they might use Javante. They might use Javante Williams as like a rotational back. Sure. And I mean, Samaj P. Ryan, he's, you know, he's not great, but he can play in all phases of the game. He's, a, a, you know, a, a, another one of these running backs that coaches trust. And Sean Payton, you know, handpicked him uh, as, as a signing in free agency. I mean, that was one of the stories of free agency to me. Sean Payton was like on the first day, he was like, I'm going to go tell Samaj P. Ryan, we have a role for you. We have this money for you. And we're going to go get Samaj P. Ryan. And, you know, I, I thought that that spoke volumes. Clearly, Javante Williams is an incredibly talented, talented, talented runner. But yeah, I, I'm with Evan. I'm skeptical. And his ADP is going to go up a lot on this news. It didn't register for Market Monday, his ADP rise. But I'm pretty sure over the next week, Javante Williams ADP is going to rise a ton. All right. We have covered a ton of ground here today. In news and rankings changes, if you want to see Evan's full top 150, you need DraftKit or DraftKit Pro. Also, later this week, we're in, we will have Brandon Thorne on the podcast to talk about his offensive line rankings. Those are up right now as part of the DraftKit as well. Ranked every offensive line, 1 through 32, with notes on all of them. It's so detailed and so good. Still think offensive line play remains under-analyzed in our game, our beloved game of fantasy football. I wanted to give a shout out to uh, Nick Rudman, who I guess he DM'd you in Discord like this, this like impression of me. Joey and Rudman. Was... Nick, Nick Rudman works for Underdog. Joey oh, yeah, Rudman. That's right. Joey I'm Rudman. Sorry. Yes. I'm sorry, yeah. Joey. Yes. Yeah. Um, and it was, I was going through the guy's uh, like Twitter profile, and Joey Rudman's dad was the voice of – the cookie monster on Sesame street. <laughs> so impressions and stuff like runs in the family there. If you guys haven't heard this, just scroll back on my Twitter or on Evan's Twitter. This guy did an incredible impression of Evan. It was so, so, so funny. And actually, I actually uh, Luke remind me next solo pod. We do. Uh, I want to put that clip into the solo pod so I can give some, uh, some commentary around it. That was so, so good. Shout out to, Joey Rudman. All right. That's going to do it for this episode. Be sure you're following me on Twitter at Adam Levitan Silva at Evan Silva at establish the run as well for Percy Luke for Evan. I am Adam. Good luck, everybody. <laughs>